Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I uh, want to. I, I have been in between uh, two or three topics uh, for tonight, and uh, I, I've just. Is it okay if I'm, I'm just transparent with you uh, for a moment? Uh, what what I am about to teach, I was like, ah, eh, that can't be God because I've taught that before, and uh, I tried to get away from it, tried to get away from it, and just kept coming back, coming back, and I'm like, okay, so uh, I've got a huge asterisk disclaimer for you tonight, okay? And I just I just work here, <laughs> uh, and that is is that uh, many of you. Uh, might have heard this before, okay? So um, if that's the case, well, then you just, you know, it, we're going to do some teaching tonight. The essence of teaching is repetition. The essence of preaching is proclamation. And uh, so for some of us, this will just be teaching tonight. Amen. So if you, if you have heard it before, you just act like you've got amnesia or something, and you, like, I mean, make me feel good or whatever, right? Amen. I, I have uh, struggled, and uh, my precious wife, thank, thank God she's been praying for me because, um, well, just thank God. Doesn't she look tan? And when I was in Louisiana, she went to uh, watch the, I'm going to tell, this is the, when we have kids, we'll, I'll pick on them until then. She went to the Blue Angels yesterday while I was in Louisiana, uh, watch that. So, you know, in, in uh, England, they, I mean, they don't know what the sun is. So, uh, at some point this weekend, my main thing at some point this weekend is to go on Amazon and uh, buy her some sunscreen so that Oh, that's the English and Irish blood that is, uh, she's not blotching. That's what we would normally tease her with, that uh, she has, she'll get red in the face when she's in front of folks. Or just if someone's, I mean, I, when I was trying, yeah, when I was trying to talk to her or flirt with her, I mean, she was red in the face just with me saying hello. So, uh, she's, not, she's not embarrassed, she's sunburned. <laughs> Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated. I, uh, I want to start uh, this evening. I, I want to start with, uh, just as uh, a beginning, Matthew chapter 10. And uh, this is some instruction that uh, Jesus gave to his disciples and uh, the Bible reads, it says, when he, you don't have to stand, where there's just kind of an introduction. I know that's our custom, but uh, we'll be okay. All right, y'all just make yourself comfortable. Uh, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Uh, now, it goes through the, the uh, names of the apostles and uh, then in verse 5 it says, Then uh, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the, slick, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. <clears throat> um, so this topic about uh, the kingdom of heaven, really, uh, it just, it uh, dominates my studies sometimes uh, because uh, it is such a broad topic uh, and it is a very often misunderstood topic, misunderstood statement. Um, but the kingdom of heaven, uh, for the purposes of the night, that uh, I, the one aspect of the kingdom of heaven that I want to focus in on 
is the authority that goes along with the kingdom of heaven being established, right? So wherever the kingdom of heaven is, uh, there is great liberty. And uh, there are, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto uh, a mustard seed, leaven, uh, a treasure that was hid in the ground. There's all kinds of parables that go along with the kingdom of heaven, trying to, or the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, trying to uh, describe exactly what the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is. And uh, from this passage of Scripture, uh, I, I, there's a principle in here that uh, I want to begin with this evening, and that is, is that wherever the kingdom of God is established, there is a principle at work. And that principle is defined as freely you have received, freely you must give. In other words, there is, there is a, an act of service, of selflessness, that goes along where the kingdom of heaven is established. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. You can't get it. You can't be in the kingdom of God and keep everything to yourself. If you are in the kingdom of God and you try to, to keep all things that you have been given to yourself, very shortly you are not going to be in the kingdom of heaven anymore because you are not operating under the king's authority. The Bible says in this particular passage of scripture that he that he commanded the disciples, the twelve, to go out. And in so going out, he commanded them to do uh, several things that we would call mighty acts, miracles, heal the sick, uh, cast out devils. Amen. I, I mean, that's, I mean, most folks think that's a pretty good Sunday night. If uh, you see somebody heal, see the devil cast out of somebody. Amen. Or maybe that's just me. Did I, did I make it? Make it to the right place. I said sit down. I didn't say go to sleep. <laughs> Amen. So uh, w w when the kingdom of heaven is established, it requires something of us. And it requires us to be actively involved in operating the king's authority in our lives. Amen. And that's just not at church. That's everywhere we go. So freely we have received, freely we should give. Anybody in here, you got the Holy Ghost? All right, praise God. That's a, that's a pretty high percentage, right? Anybody in here that you paid for the Holy Ghost? Anybody in here you labored for the Holy Ghost? No. I, uh, when I prayed through... Uh, now, I, I, I prayed through when I was in college. Uh, it was uh, my junior year in engineering school. And uh, mo most of you, thank God, uh, don't know much about my past, but I was, a, I was an idiot, just an absolute idiot. Uh, I, was, I was an alcoholic, and uh, among other things, and I was just kind of the guy that... I. How many parents we got in here? All right, I was the guy that you would not let your kids hang out with, right? You'd be like, hey, I'm going, I'm going over to Stu's house, and you'd be like, mm -mm, no, not tonight, you're not, right? So I, I, I brought a lot of baggage with me when I, whenever God began to deal with me about, uh, about my soul. And I, uh, the church that I was going to uh, was a... a very, it was a wonderful church, but <clears throat> they hadn't prayed anybody through in like six, seven, eight. It was actually about nine months. So they didn't really know what to do with me because whenever God started dealing with me, I mean, I was, I was hungry. So like tonight, the pastor could have got up and taught. I don't, I, he could have taught on tithing. And if I didn't have the Holy Ghost, I'd have gone to the altar seeking the Holy Ghost because I, I didn't want to go to hell. Amen. So in, in that particular church, that particular setting, 
that there was they really just didn't know what to do uh, about you know what what my seeking level was and so when I would go to the altar no one really knew how to help me pray first of all I didn't really know how to pray right and uh, so I would go and how many of y'all ever how, how many of y'all have ever been to a church other than Antioch, a, 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 a Pentecostal apostolic church, right? I don't have any boys down here, but uh, have y'all ever seen them? You, you from North Carolina, right? Yeah, so you know this. Went down in the South, this is how we do altar call. Is somebody comes to the altar, and they just kind of push them around. So they're praying, and they get a circle, and they push them back and forth because... They don't really know what to do. They're just trying to keep them in the circle, <laughs> keep them at the altar, right? But nobody's talking to you. Nobody's doing anything. You just, Jesus, Jesus, give me the Holy Ghost, Jesus. So I, I did that. Uh, literally, I did that for about three months, and we were in revival uh, services. And in the South, what that means is you go to church five times a week. <laughs> did I get one amen? <laughs> So five times a week, I was up at the altar. You know, they were throwing me, throwing me around. And uh, it, got, it got so bad, got so bad, Mike, that people stopped going to the altar with me. I was up there by myself, banging off the walls or whatever, right? And uh, freely we've given, uh, freely we've received, freely we've got to give, right? Well, I thought in my mind, because of all the things that I was involved with before God began to deal with me, that somehow or another I had to earn God's favor. And so I'm, I'm up there, I mean, continuously like repenting. And I mean, I'm, I'm repenting over, you know, something that I did to Brother Shelton when, when we were, I was eight and he was 12. You know, it wasn't that bad, but it was, it was something like that, right? <clears throat> and so finally, they just kind of give up, right? And uh, I'm uh, in the prayer room, pre, you know, pre-service one day, and I'm sitting, I'm kneeled down praying, okay? And I'm, trying to, and I'm trying to pray in English, but it keeps all coming out, jabbered up, or whatever. And I mean, it's just me praying. <clears throat> and I'm like, man, that is just so weird that I can't pray. I wonder what's going on. I mean, I can't pray. What's going on, right? So we come out of the prayer room, and uh, I, I was I was uh, got up from praying, and I thought, well, man, is this God? I mean, I was just like, boy, is this God? So I thought, well, okay, Carlos is me, right? I said, God, if this is you, well, you know, well, let's go. So I stood up in the in the prayer room. I was the only one left in the prayer room. And I started trying to say hallelujah. And it, and it was like, but it wasn't, it was, you know, sort of like hallelujah, but it wasn't hallelujah. And I'm like, no, nah, that can't be, that, that's got to be me. That's not God, right? So get down out of the prayer room and uh, I, I start worshiping, you know, because you don't need the Holy Ghost to worship, to dance or rejoice. What they did that in the Old Testament. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm dancing, if you can imagine this, they're done, they're done messing with me, right? I'm dancing down the, the uh, middle aisle, and I'm just praising God. God, you're great. Uh, God, you're awesome, you know. I mean, I'm just giving God, giving God glory. And uh, Brother Ray Hassel, you guys don't know him, but he was, he was my pastor at the time. And he was the home missions director for Arkansas for like, 30 or 40 years. He helped start like two, 300 churches or something like that. He was just one of the most sweetest, kindest men that, uh, that you would ever imagine. And uh, he called me Brother Stew. He, till, he, till he passed away, he could not pronounce my name correctly. Stew. Brother Stew. So I'm dancing down the center aisle, and Mike, he says, Brother Stew, in the microphone, Brother Stew, how do you like that Holy Ghost? And I Turned and answer, turned to answering back, and I and I tried to say I love it. It's so good, but it all came out jumbled up, and I went, "What in the world is that?" 
And I said, tried to, you know, say some more stuff to God about how good he was and how much I loved him. And it all just came out jumbled up. And I'm like, Lord have mercy, I think I just received the Holy Ghost. Now, unfortunately, you, you guys don't know this, Brother Shelton's mom is my aunt. And she had, she had bri bribed me for the better part of five years when I, while I was in college about going to church with her. Uh, free meals, cleaning clothes, as my wife says, that's, you know, that's pretty high on my list because washing is pretty low on my list. And uh, so I, I, you know, she'd been trying to bribe me all this time. Well, I went home and called her. You know, I dialed her up, tell her I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Thank God she recognized the number because I couldn't talk English. And uh, so she finally figured out who it was and she started crying and and uh, worshiping God, and the next thing you know, we're talking in tongues to each other on the phone, back and forth, right? My point with all that story is, is that I, 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 did, I tried to earn the Holy Ghost. I really did. I tried to do everything that I, I was fasting before I got the Holy Ghost. Now, that's spiritual right there, and uh -huh, Lord. But, but trying to do everything that I could do to earn the Holy Ghost, to get good enough to have God... But in the end of all of that, I learned a principle of the kingdom of God that has stuck with me since that very, that very first interaction with God. It, and that is, is that the kingdom of God, what you get in God, is free. It's absolutely 100% free. The salvation of God, free. God's redemption, free. God's power, free free. God's authority, free. God's liberty, free. You can't earn anything in God. Freely, it's given to you. And the principle is, is that freely you've received, freely you've got to give. And where most Christians end up is that freely they get, but then they just don't give. All of a sudden, you know, their money turns into their money. And their time turns into their time. And so what happens is, is that they keep receiving from God, but there's never a giving. Amen. So the principle of the Scripture is, the principle of the kingdom of God, is that freely we've received and freely we should give. Amen. I want to be a giver. I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to be a taker. I, don't, I want to be a receiver. But I want to be a giver. So what, uh, what that translates to and what we're talking about tonight is the altar. Because freely, what you got in the beginning, you got at the altar. The Hebrew word for altar is, uh, now I'm going to butcher this, but it's M-I-Z-B-E-A-C-H, like Ms. Beach. And it's found 396 times in Scripture. It denotes a raised place where a sacrifice is made. So the altar is a place of sacrifice. It literally means to slaughter or to slay. So when they went to the altar in the Old Testament, it was a raised place. It was a hill to where that they were going to go and make sacrifice unto God. It was a place that you could see for, for way far around, you knew that that was the altar because it was a raised place. It was a place of distinction. The altar is a place of importation. It's where flesh is paid for spiritual blessing. And it's most notably seen in the change. Um, in 1 Kings chapter 18, there is a uh, story about uh, Israel in an unre in a unrepented state that they had turned from God and began to worship Baal. 
And uh, Elisha, the prophet, J, Elijah, the prophet, came and basically uh, what he told the king was there was a famine in the land and he said, uh, we're gonna, God has sent me here and we're going to have a little demonstration of God's, uh, God's power. He said, so goes down through that, that chapter there and he says, speaks to the, uh, the, the uh, nation of Israel and he said, why halt you between two opinions? He said, if God's God, let's serve God. And if Baal's God, let's serve Baal. And then, and then he makes this challenge. He says, uh, here's what we're going to do. You go, get your, you go get the sacrifice, the, the animals, okay? And we're going to lay them on the altar. And uh, the prophets of Baal, there are 450 of them, so y'all ought to be able to get it done. Y'all do what you're going to do with your sacrifice. You put it on the altar. I, you bring me a sacrifice. I'm going to do what I'm going to do and put that on the altar. And then the scripture says, the Bible says, it says, the God, Elijah said, the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And what he had told them was, put that, put that sacrifice there and don't put any fire under it. And the reason that uh, this was the, the entire nation that had turned from God that was, that was worshiping Baal. And so when it first came down, the, the entire nation, when he made this challenge, answered him. They said, it's a good thing. This is good. Let whoever's God answer by fire, it's good. And the reason they did that was, was because they had seen every time that they had, that they had, uh, that they had uh, commissioned a temple, that God had fallen, the fire of God had fallen out of heaven and consumed the, uh, the uh, sacrifice that was on the altar. So those Jews knew that God had answered by fire. Amen. So they said, it's a good thing, right? And then, <laughs> when he goes down and he says, you do your sacrifice, but don't put any fire under it, and I'm going to do my sacrifice, we're not going to put any fire under it. The Bible says that they answered him not a word. And the reason that they did that was, was because all of the prophets of Baal had been running, running around and they were, they were doing a counterfeit sacrifice. Amen. What they would do is, they would take the uh, sacrifice, they'd get the altar just right, right? And they would take fire, Sister Johnson, and they would put that fire up under, up under the altar. And then they would snuff, they would, they would uh, take the oxygen, they'd put it down to where that there wouldn't be any oxygen in it, so it was just smoldering. And then they'd step up and they'd make some big prayer to Baal. And when they, and when they got done with that prayer, they'd let a little oxygen in and fire would come up and consume that, that sacrifice that was on the altar. This is God. That's what everybody, that's how, that's how they beguiled Israel is that they were making a false representation of God. So Elijah knows this. He steps up and he says, you do your sacrifice. I'm going to do my sacrifice, but nobody's going to put any fire anywhere around this thing. Because whoever, whoever answers by fire, let him be God. Amen. So if there, if there, was, a, uh, there was a drought, a, a horrible drought. Horrible drought. So when Elijah went and told them, go and get all of, all of these buckets of water and put on the altar, what he was doing was he was making real sure that nobody was tricking on the sacrifice that was the altar. And he put enough water on there that even if somehow or another they would gotten strange fire out of that, uh, underneath that altar, underneath that sacrifice, that there'd be enough water there that it wouldn't burn. That what, whoever answered by fire, that was going to be God. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting that the reason 
there are, uh, you know, and you look in the Bible, there is the, there's earth, wind, fire. Not, not, the, not the singing group either, right? <clears throat> so, I, it's, it's odd to me that God chose fire. That God chose fire to be able to confirm His presence. You ever thought about that before? Why he didn't choose water? I mean, he chose, he chose rain to be, uh, to be symbolic of his blessing, but he chose fire to be symbolic of his presence. That's why when Moses saw the uh, burning bush that was not consumed, the reason that it wasn't consumed was, was because it, it, was a, it was a theophany. It was, it was supposed to be like God, and God can't change. But fire, did you know that fire is actually the result of a chemical reaction? That's right. Look it up. You Google it. Google it for me. Fire is the result of a chemical reaction. And every chemical reaction causes and requires a change. So the reason that God chose fire to be able to be symbolic of His presence was, was that when we come into the presence of God and we place ourselves on the altar of sacrifice, when we come in contact with God, God doesn't change. But we are supposed to change. Every time that we go to the altar, something that is not like God is supposed to die. It's supposed to be burned up. It's supposed to be consumed. So the reason that we get self-ish as Christians is because we keep, we keep coming into the presence of God and touched by God, but unchanged by His presence. Brother Lewis, I'll tell it to you like this. Fire, the, the, the chemical reaction that causes fire is called oxidation. Oxidation, that's right, buddy. You got it now. Boom, you grow up to be an engineer. Did you know that uh, the same chemical reaction that causes fire is oxidation? Did you know that the same chemical react that same chemical reaction, if there's enough energy around to suck up the heat. Do you know what you know what that is? Yeah, man, you you bust it off with oxidation. Do you know what that is? You do. You don't know what that is. <laughs> when something rusts, it oxidizes. So the difference between fire being changed and something rusting is, what, is how it interacts with its surroundings. Fire has so much oxidation that it creates so much energy that it affects, it cannot give off the heat or the energy to its surroundings fast enough, and so it bursts into flames. Rust is the opposite. It does the same thing but it's in contact with its surroundings so much that its surroundings affect what's happening to it. And so it does not change. It just gives up and changes what's around it. So in, in the presence of God, what happens is, is that because we don't change, we don't allow God to fall and consume everything that's like Him, what happens to us is that our spirit begins to rust. Our heart begins to rust. Because we are, in, we are involved with things that are around us that take up our time, our finances, our attention, and it, it affects us to the place that we cannot change. And I feel it. I feel the Holy Ghost all of a sudden. We get so involved with what's around us in the world that when we come into contact with God 
in a manner that God ordained it, that God's fire falls on the altar, and we are so in contact, so consumed by this world, this age, this time, that God cannot change us because we cannot allow God to change. We're just, we're so everywhere else that we're, we're not even aware. God visited and we're not even aware that God came down and began to talk to me about that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in a completely different direction than what I thought I was, but I, I believe God is here. Amen. So the altar is a place of distinction. It's a place of change. And that's what, uh, that's what we do when we come into contact with God. That's what's supposed to happen. God cannot change, but everything that's not like God in us is supposed to change. Amen. Amen. So the purpose of the altar is, is just that. God is a revealer of himself. Of anything in Scripture, God is, re, is a revealer. The very first thing that God did, God, God created light. And what light does is light goes in, and what was hidden, what was dark, is revealed. It appears because of the light. God is a revealer. And at the altar, God reveals himself. The scripture says that it is the goodness of God that calls us to repentance. It's not your mama. It's not your daddy. It's not your husband. It's not your wife. It's not your screaming kids or your quiet kids. It's the goodness of God that calls you to repent. I only bring that up because there was a little precious kid on the flight from New Orleans back this afternoon that Lord Jesus, <laughs> bless the kid, yes, and me. That was the longest two hours and 14 minutes I've had in my life in a long time. Amen. It's not... It's not what's around us, it's always the goodness of God. So at the altar, God reveals Himself, and when we look at ourselves in contrast to Him, that's what makes us change. When I compare myself to God, whew, really? I mean, most of the time, I'm a real, I'm, most of the time, most of the time, I'm a pretty nice guy. Now, I do have my moments. Yeah, sure do. Brother Savage, most of the time, I'm, I'm a pretty nice guy. But I do have my moments. When I, but when I come into the presence of God, and God, and it's the timing of God, and God begins to deal with something that's going on with me, when I see myself in terms of Him, it's like, oh, oh, oh. Anybody, you, you know what I'm talking about? Where it's just like, how in the world did I let this go on in my heart for so long? <laughs> it's, it, you, you, I mean, when he reveals it, now up to that point, it's like, you know, you're just bumping along. And then all of a sudden, God, God reveals, and it's like, <gasps> I got to get this out of me. Absolutely. I mean, this, this has got to go. This has got to die. This has got to burn up. This has got to be consumed in my life. And that's the way that God works. We look at His goodness. It's the goodness of God that causes us to repent, that causes us to place ourselves on the altar and, and allow God's fire to consume everything that is not like Him. That is the purpose of the altar. The purpose of the altar is for there to be less of me and more of Him. That's the purpose of your altar. That's the purpose of every person's altar that has ever come into contact with God. That raised place of distinction. Does anybody ever... I mean, Anybody, just t show a hands, right? Is there some point in your life that you remember 
that God began to deal with you about something, and you lay, you you like, I got to lay this down. I got to, I got to move on from this. I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a real quick story about a young man that's here that was at youth camp, and this was back before, uh, this was back when I had brown hair. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> And uh, God began to deal with him about some stuff that was going on in his life because he, he was wrapped up in sports. He was, you know, he was, he was pretty good at, at uh, sports, and he was kind of, a, you know, kind of a stud. And the Lord got a hold of him and said, no, nope, you're done with that. Now, he's on staff today, but I remember, I specific, I'll never forget in my life, Remember watching Mike McGurk get off the floor of the gym in, in Staunton, Virginia. Tear, I mean, ju- just wrecked. He wouldn't want me to tell you. He had snot. I mean, it, I, I went to hug him, and I was like, thank God. Oh, you know, it was bad. But he left some stuff. There was an old Mike. That, that, laid, that laid some stuff down, when he got up, he was, he was changed. You remember that? Do you? There's some times in my life that I remember when God began to, I'm talking about a raised place of distinction that I can go back in time and point to that and say, when I came in contact with God right then, I changed. I changed forever. I was never the same from that prayer in my life. That's what the altar should be. That's what the altar is for me. That's what the altar is for you. There was a time that Tony Lewis came in, the old Tony Lewis, came into contact with God, and, the, and something changed in you. The fire You probably couldn't see it, but the fire of God fell in you, and it consumed everything that was in you at that time that was not like God. Boom. And when you got up, there was a different Tony. Now, I've told you all of that to come back and tell you this. The kingdom of God is this principle. Freely you've received, freely you should give. So let's talk about how we help people at the altar. Of their life. The altar is not, the altar is not, not this area up here. It is not. I I believe that I can prove to you that the altar of God is right here. It is in every man's heart. The scripture says, Hebrews chapter 4 and 12, I believe, says that the word of God is quick and powerful, and and it, it is what goes in and divides the soul and the spirit. There, it is only God that can actually get into you and divide and discern what the thoughts and intents of your heart is. And it is at the altar, it's in your heart, that the altar of God actually is established. It's not a location. So the altar of God can be a college campus. Altar of God can be at a red light. Altar of God can be your home, your friend's home. I know this is like crazy talk, but the altar of God could actually happen at Starbucks. Where we all pay our tithe. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. So the purpose of the altar is change, and the place of the altar is within us. It's within our heart. So it, it is important that when you see someone that has made a place, uh, uh, has acted on their faith when they're coming down or they're standing where they are, we never want anyone praying by themselves at the altar. Ever. Because freely... Freely I've received, freely I give. And I'll just, I'll just make it plain. 
If you can stand beside someone that's praying, and you see that you can, you can discern that God's touching them, and you're not, you're not engaged enough to pray with them, I would just ask you to question how much kingdom of God is in you. Because if the principle of God is not at work, that freely you've received, freely you get, I mean, amen. Well, that got one amen. So anyway, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, we see that we have become the sacrifice. It's our hearts, it's us that God changes. Let's talk about faith. Faith is a process. Uh, Its appearance is never, everybody say never. Faith is never a single event. Can't happen. Faith is never a single event. A faith level is the sum of many God encounters. Anybody in your life that you you know that God touched you and you felt and you knew that you went to another level in your faith? Anybody? That's just me? You got to a place to where that you, 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 man, I was a little timid to pray for somebody or pray for this, pray for in this setting. But all of a sudden, over the course of many encounters with God, Man, that's just like, almost like second nature. Like, my nature is now God's nature. So faith is the sum of many encounters that we have with God. When we are working the altar, you've got to think in steps of faith, not the event of faith. And by that, what I mean is, is that, let's just say for a moment, that uh, during burden bearing, right? We're going to pray for everybody. And, and the minister that's leading that says something like, hey, if you feel comfortable, just close your eyes and lift your hands, right? And you, being obedient, you close your eyes and lift your hands, and then because freely you've received <laughs> and you're trying to give, you look at your neighbor, not because you're done, but you, you, you're looking around because you're ready to give. And you see someone that they have responded in faith by the lifting of their hands. That is a faith step. It's not natural for someone to come in that has, that has maybe not had an encounter with God to be able to lift their hands. It's not natural. I, maybe it was natural for you. Let me, let me stop right. It was not natural for me. First time that I, I was like, man, I, you know, should I lift my hand? And do I want to lift my hands? That seems odd. That's crazy. Why would I want to lift my hand? This is what's going on in my head, right? Man, I don't know if I want to lift my That seems, man, they look weird lifting their, their hands. And then it's like, okay, well, uh, well, oh, well, hey, that feels pretty good. See, that, that, wasn't, that was just a small faith step in being able to lift my hands to God and approach God and have an encounter with God. Whereas most people, what they do is they think that God, you, to, in order to have a new level of faith, that you've got to have some crazy supernatural, you know, that all of a sudden God swoops down and you levitate. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're at a new faith level. And God doesn't work like that. God works in incre- The more that you push out yourself and let God establish his kingdom in your life, the more faith comes into you. And the more you begin to operate faith. So we want to be very aware of where people are making small faith steps that, where that we can freely give. Where you can come along someone, beside someone and go, man, doesn't that feel good to, you know, to lift your hands? Man, you know, when I, when I lift my hand, I feel like I'm lifting my heart up to God. Man, that feels good, doesn't it? I'm in complete surrender to God. That's what, 
That's what faith is doing when we're building faith with people. Amen. So the altar happens any, anywhere. The altar is not a place. It's a, it's a place of distinction in the heart. It's not a location. It happens in the heart. And where the altar is, faith, <clears throat> faith is actually established and exhibited. Amen. So, faith defined is this. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, everybody can quote this, I'm sure. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That, that's faith defined, right? Sort of. I mean, I, I don't really understand what that means, right? That's what faith does. That's what we do with faith. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And here is faith defined. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Could I submit to you tonight that there are two parts to faith? There, the first part is, is that you've got to understand that Jehovah is God. Amen. You can't have faith in Buddha and Jehovah do something. You can't have faith in yourself. Since we're talking about other gods, <clears throat> and, and God do something for you. So the first thing is, is that you've got to realize who God is. You've got to believe that He is. You know, that, that, is, that is the... Noel, I think I've told you this before. The greatest lesson that anyone can ever learn is that there is a God... And number two, you're not him. You get those two things down, and you cut a lot of corn. You go a long ways. So the first thing is, is understanding that he's God. And the second part of faith is, is that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You've got to understand that if you seek and pursue God, that God is going to reward you. It might not be anything but rewarding you with his presence. But he's going to reward you. If you seek him, you'll find God. If you seek him, you'll find less of you and more of him. So faith is believing that there is a God and also that if I seek him, he's going to reward me. Believing that there is a God gets no one from where Brother Phil Schoenthal is sitting to here. No one walks down and says, oh, I'm just walking down here because I believe there's a God. Amen. What gets someone moving is, is that if I go pursue God, it's that second element of faith. If I go and seek God and pursue God, I'm going to find God. I'm, God's going to reward me. Amen. So, it's faith steps. It's believing that there's a God and that He is a rewarder. So, at the altar, God reveals Himself to the unbeliever. At the altar, God reveals more of Himself to the weak in faith. At the altar, faith is born. And at the altar, faith is grown. And again, the altar is not a location. The the altar is in your heart. In your heart, every time you have a God encounter, that's where faith is born and faith is grown. Faith is the sum of many steps. It is, it is not a single event. And that, that one fact, I have seen more people 
in ministry be tripped up over the fact that they don't have faith because they're looking for some huge, earth-shattering, talking in tongues so much that you got an accent, levitating while you're doing it, and it's not that at all. It's, it's every encounter that you, that you have with God, something in you changes. Amen. Faith pres- provides access to God. Put on the screen for me Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Okay. Thank you. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all, for that all have sinned. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Let's, let's, verse 1. Thank you. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Our faith is what gives us access to God. Another way to say this is, is that God responds to faith and not to need. There are a lot of needs in this world. I, I've got a lot of needs. But the, re, the reason that God doesn't respond to need is because faith is what gives us access. Just because you've got a need, if you have no faith, you have no access. So when you build your faith, along many encounters with God that you are changed, what you're doing is you're creating and giving yourself more access to God. Amen. So the simplicity of the matter is, is that ministering to people starts, it starts with identifying personal need and building faith to a level where God responds. It's that simple. People, I, I've, as youth pastor for 16 years, youth pastoring for 16 years, the question that I got asked the most, if you can believe it is, Brother Mott, I want to be used in ministry. How do I, how am I, how do I get used? How does God use me in ministry. And most of the time, and I say this most of the time being like 99.99999% of the time, the person that's asking that question doesn't understand what ministry is because they've got it built up to be some, you know, huge pulpit thing and what ministry is not that at all. The simplicity of ministry starts with identifying someone's need. You get that? God doesn't respond to to a need. But ministry starts with understanding what that person's need is. God responds to faith. So ministry is understanding what that person's need is and working with them to build their faith to a place that they have access, that God responds. That's what ministry is. Ministry is helping to build their faith to a place that they they have access to God. That's what ministry is. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 6, and I'm this is probably the bulk of what most of y'all want to hear, but I'm going to move quickly here. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? It is uncanny how many times that uh, you see someone in the altar And uh, I'm I'm not saying that this is bad. I'm just saying that it's not as good as it could be. Mike, come help me. So, Mike, 
has a need, come, he's got some faith, comes up, you burden bearer, and you got something you, we need to pray about. <laughs> I'm just playing with you. <laughs> so he comes up, right, and, and, he, and he's, going, he's, he's here, and he's going to start praying, okay? You just, just lift your hand and start praying, Jesus, help me. You do, Lord, 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 right? Oh, he's praying. <laughs> there you go. Now he's really praying. And, and, what, and what we do in thinking of ministry, a lot of times, is that we say, oh, well, I'm going to pray with him. And we start talking in tongues. And he's still, Lord, 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 Lord. And, and, we're, and I'm not saying that talking in tongues is bad. I'm just saying that what ministry is, is understanding what his need is and helping to build his faith to a place that he accesses God and God responds in faith. And what, what we do a lot of times, because we are, we are not, we're kind of concerned about, well, I, you know, I don't, man, I, boy, I want God to move on me. You know, I want to be used in ministry. Do you have a headache? And we feel, we feel like that, seriously, we feel like that that's what we got to do to be able to minister to him. So what the scripture says is that I, I can, and, it, and this is Paul, he says I, you can talk in tongues till you just, I mean, that's all you do. Except I speak, but what shall I profit you? What shall I profit you? Now, now don't misunderstand what I'm saying, okay? Don't, don't, don't call Pastor Wright and say, Brother Mott said we're not supposed to talk in tongues anymore. Because that's a lie. And I know just how to answer that text that I'll get later on tonight. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that what, if, if you do that, what profit are you in, uh, in helping that person to build faith? You ever, I mean, is anybody in here, you've ever had a need, and you're like, man, I got to get this and somebody comes along and pray, and, and it's like, man, what language is it that that they're talking in? And you just, you, I mean, they're just, I mean, there's no joining of faith. There's no building of faith. It's, it is, it's just no profit. Is that just me? Do I need to go pray? <laughs> okay, good. Thank God, right? <clears throat> so, but we, but freely, We've received, so freely we want to give. So what I'm, what I'm trying to do lightly is to be able to come and challenge all of us. We should be ministers. We should minister what we've freely received. We should freely give. I know this is crazy talk, but every once in a while I just walk up to somebody and say, hey, what well, do we need to pray about? And they're like, oh, my dog's sick. You know, and I'm like, Lord bless them. And, you know, and right on, or, or maybe it's like, you know, hey, my mom's sick. Thinks she might have cancer. Well, hey, let's pray for your mom that the will of God be done in her life and, and, and that you have peace and that God helps your faith to be able to minister to your mom in this, in this time. Let's pray. Right? So... <clears throat> Many times there's a trap that we just leave 1 Corinthians up there that we, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse, yeah. Many times there's a trap because it is the easy and comfortable thing to do. That's the trap because it doesn't, it doesn't bother our flesh. Man, I, I wow. <clears throat> Y'all don't be mad at me. The reason that it's easy is because it doesn't bother our flesh. It doesn't require anything of our faith. And so it's very easy to come down and disengage by talking in tongues. Amen. <clears throat> Here's what we says of this. It says, now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues... 
What will it profit you unless I speak to you either in the form of a disclosure of the truth or in that of experiential knowledge or in that of an impartation of a divine revelation or in that of teaching? Yet even in the case of lifeless things which give out a sound, whether it be a wind instrument or a harp, if it does not make a difference in the sounds, how will the music which is played by the wind instrument of the harp be understood? For if a military trumpet gives an indistinct sound, who shall put himself in readiness of war? Thus also in your case, if by means of the tongue you do not give a word which is clear and and definite, how will that which is being spoken be understood? For you will be speaking into the air. Praise the Lord. I feel some of you right now, you're like, oh, man. But that's what we do because we're comfortable. We are comfortable with talking in tongues. And so what we do is, instead of helping someone build their faith, understanding the need, what we do is we do something that's comfortable for us because it doesn't require us to change. So let's talk about these four sources of ministry real quick in light of faith steps. You've got to remember that the altar is a place where more of God appears and less of man appears. So the other way to say that is is that the altar is the place where more of God appears and the more of man disappears. That's That's what the purpose of the altar is. So the four sources are the how to identify a person's need. And after that need is identified, we build faith to gain access to receive. So revelation, the Greek word here is actually apocalypse. And it means to appear. Ephesians chapter 1 says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of your prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ... And the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. So revelation occurs when we become aware of information uh, that we we weren't aware of before. So the way that revelation works when we are trying to identify a person's need is that we are we're down they're down here praying and you you pick up something. You ever, you ever been praying with somebody, Brother Bishop? I mean, you just, you're having a pretty good day. And then you go to pray for that person, it's like, man, I feel tired all of a sudden. Because what you're doing is, God is revealing what's inside of them, either through the laying on of hands or, or gift of revelation, etc. So there is a flow of revelation that when you are praying, that God would reveal to you, here is the need. Every once in a while, I'm, I'm praying along. This doesn't happen very often, but praying along, and, you, and, and I'll feel like kind of an overwhelming sense of fear or dread all of a sudden. And it's like, wow. And then you say, hey, man, let, uh, you know, are, are, are you battling with fear? Let, let, let's pray that the peace of God would, you know, would, That's what revelation does. I'll give you another example of of revelation. And this happens very, very rarely, but it it has happened over the years. In dealing with youth, one of of the, uh, I don't know how to say this, one of the most common things that you see in young girls is that they have image issues. How they, they, they judge themselves by the world. And it, it has happened, a couple, the, the Bible says that we are to look into the mirror of God's Word. And that, and that, the, and that God's Word is what should reflect on us of what our image actually is. And ever so often, in praying with a young lady, I will get an image of them in front of a mirror 
not the mirror of God, but in front of a mirror, accusing themselves. Oh, man, I just don't like that. Anybody's, she's laughing. You've done, <laughs> every woman knows how to do that. That's right. Every female knows how to, I'm just, I'm just mimicking. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> I'm just doing what I've seen. Then they go in, go in the bedroom and they come back out and they got something else on. <laughs> that's what, that's, that, is, that is what revelation is, is being in a situation where that God reveals all of a sudden, hey, this is what's going on. This person is battling. They're battling with the voice of this world, telling them that they're not pretty enough. They're not skinny enough. They're not good enough. They don't look like what, you know, some model or whatever that's in the, that's in the supermarket. And then responding to them and being able to see that, see that need and begin to say, hey, God loves you for who you are. Let's, talk, let, let's begin to pray and ask God to remove that voice. God, the Bible says that, God, that uh, God's sheep, they know his voice. They know not the voice of a stranger. Let's curse the word, the, the word and the voice of this world. And you begin to build faith so that they can respond out of that need. That's how the gift of revelation works. I'm closing. Well, I'm, I'm finishing. I don't know what that really means, but I'm, I'm, I'm starting to finish, right? The gift of uh, knowledge. So Revelation deals with the hidden things or the things that are, that are not seen uh, in, our, in our perception. Knowledge. Uh, this, is, this is gnosis, and it's knowledge or science. So knowledge is, is information. Knowledge is a situation. Knowledge of a situation is transmitted by human interaction or human capacity. God brings this information to your attention through counseling sessions, care groups, or someone simply tells you this information, it's perfectly reasonable and acceptable to ask someone his or her need. The source of need identification does not add to or diminish from God answering the need. Just because someone tells you what they're praying for doesn't make the answer any less spiritual than if God spoke to you and said, hey, I, you know, Da, 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 da. I, I see a time, and this is where this happened, and whatever, and they're like, <gasps> whoo, you know, that's not, that's not what makes it God. What makes it God is the access. <clears throat> so knowledge is this flow. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but uh, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Simply put, you have the knowledge of a need due to human means, Right? Pulpit ministry, teaching, altar work, knowledge is a legitimate source of need identification to build faith for God to respond. Very quickly, perception is a part of knowledge. A man is three, three parts, the trichotomy man, body, soul, and spirit, right? Hebrews chapter 4, uh, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 23 says, "...in the very God of peace..." Sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and, be, uh, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's three parts to every person. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter uh, 5 and verse 15 says, But strong meat belong to them that are of a full age, even though those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and, leave, uh, good and evil. Perception is not observing human behavior, but catch this, okay? Perception is not observing human behavior. Perception is viewing a person's inner man through the prism of their outward man. So let's talk about some perceptions, some examples of perception. Anybody ever been praying with someone? And they just, I mean, you're praying, and I mean, you're praying the paint off the walls, right? And you kind of look up over, and, and they're just not saying a word. 
tell me somebody that that's it. Okay, thank you. I just thought that was me. I'm like, man, I'm the worst minister ever, right? What does that mean when someone's praying, talking about perception? What does that tell you about them if they won't pray out loud? Hello? The Scripture says, I believe, therefore I've spoken. Somebody that doesn't pray out loud has got a faith problem. That wasn't some big hoo-boo whatever that I figured out. I just look at you, and you're not praying out loud. I know you got a faith problem. (laughs) Boy, boy, boy. Jesus. (laughs) Some of y'all are like, you mean I got to pray out loud? Well, if you got faith, I'm telling you, you're going to pray out loud. I'm not saying that. The Bible says it. The book says, I believe, therefore I've spoken. If you don't pray out loud, you got a faith problem. You got a believing problem. Glory, hallelujah. Perception, right? What does, it, what does it mean? What does it mean if you see someone and you're, you know, and I'm talking about we're burden bearing, you're freely you've received, freely you're given, you're praying with someone and, and, the, and the minister that's helping, you know, leading service, what do they say? Everybody lift your hands and the person you're praying with is like, what do you perceive that your senses are exercised to the point where you can perceive good and evil. I mean, if, if the pastor says, hey, let's pray, lift your hands and pray, and somebody does like that, is that good or evil? Well, it's not evil. It's, it's carnal, right? Carnal. Let's just say it like that. It's not good. Not good. It's not, maybe not evil, but it's not good. Well, the Scripture says that we, that we lift up holy hands. So what does it tell you if someone doesn't want to lift up their hands? Hands can't be holy. The only thing that can be holy is a person's heart. So they're, if they can't lift their hands, they, they, are, they are in contrast to God's holiness, and so they will not surrender because they are afraid of what God is going to do to them. Praise the Lord. Perception. Can't pray out loud. What about this? Just real quick, right? Anybody ever seen someone and they're, 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 they're praying and they can't get their chin off their chest? But, I mean, they can't even lift it. The Scripture says that, that God is the lifter of our chin. He's the one that brings us joy. So when somebody, they, they, they're... They're praying like this. Lord, what? They've got no joy. They've got no joy in their, they have, they're battling fear. They're battling all kinds of things because they have no joy. Stand with me. Oh, I did not. So perception, let me end with this. Perception Perception is one of the flows. And just because you perceive, just because you have knowledge of something by your, by your natural perceptions, right? You're not, you're not doing that and you're not viewing someone in their... You're, what you're doing is you're looking at their soul through their outward man. Because only the Word of God is sharp enough to be able to divide the soul and the spirit. And what you see in a person when they are seeking God is a reflection of of the condition of their soul. Amen. When you look in the mirror, you don't see your soul, but you see the reflection or the result of the condition of your soul. And when someone is next to you that we are trying to minister to and, and, and help them build their faith, what you're looking at is you are looking at their soul. Through the, through the appearance of their outward man. Prophesying, prophesying is, pre, is predicting. That will profit someone. Doctrine, doctrine is instructing, instruction, and that will profit someone. So the four ways that you can be a prof, that you can profit those that you are ministering to is through 
<clears throat> knowledge is through knowledge, uh, revelation, doctrine, and one more, prophesy. Amen. So the altar is the place where the unbeliever becomes aware of his or her need for God, and it is our ministry that helps build their faith to a place that they have access to God's presence, and He supplies the answer. We must always, if you don't get anything else out of what I've said, remember the altar happens at the heart. We must always leave the altar with this reinforcing thought. He is. I don't know what your need is, but He is. He is. Can you lift your hands? Thank you, Jesus, for our time, for your word. God, I pray that this word would profit us, that it would profit your kingdom, profit those that uh, you bring us in contact with. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would let us act in faith by your grace. Let this word be profitable to those that you bring into our path that we could minister what we have freely received, we could freely give. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks, and honor, and glory. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for enduring to the end.